and he also is the executive director of a regional common security initiative called the 3 plus 3 Coalition for Northeast Asia's Nuclear Weapons Free Zone. Uh, Mr. Inazuka is joining us online, uh, so Tadashi, we welcome you and look forward to your opening welcome words. Thank you, Alan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. I'd like to congratulate uh, for the inauguration of Law and Not War campaign. And thank you very much, Alan and Rebecca, uh, for the preparation. And I'd I'm, I'm honored to, um, to see Sir Kenneth Keith, uh, although it's, it's online, I'm honored to see you. And uh, of course, we are. This campaign is uh, looking into compulsory uh, jurisdiction of the ICJ. Uh, you know, as <clears throat> as uh, as an international organ, uh, it's it's normal to uh, to listen to the, the opinion of the ICJ. What what is you know what that is mean is willingness to show the willingness to resolve conflict by the, the international law. I think it's, it's a very, very normal thing to do that, but somehow it is very difficult at the moment. And this is uh, uh, something, you know, reviving the international arena. I saw uh, in January of this year, United Nations Security Council chaired by uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi of Japan. Japan, luckily, one of the like-minded uh, states uh, of uh, you know promotion of the ICJ this time. And I was very happy to to see this happening. And this remind reminds me of the CICC campaign in 2007, which led to the Japanese uh, ratification of the International Criminal Court. At that time, I was really wondering why Japan could not ratify the ICC. Everybody said many things. For instance, probably domestic law is not in you know, accordance with the ICC, uh, or maybe we have too much US pressure uh, to, to the ratification. So first thing I did was to meet with uh, Judge Wada of ICJ. I'm sure uh, Judge Keith uh, knows uh, Judge Wada. And Judge Wada told me that he talked with uh, Ministry of Justice people for three days, and he convinced everybody that Japan should ratify uh, the ICC. And I said, why, uh, if everybody is uh, accordance with uh, you know, international law, why we cannot even sign the, the international treaty like this? He said, well, it's a lack of political will. It's, uh, it's just a lack of political will. So this is where I, I believe the campaign, like uh, Law Not War uh, campaign comes in you know, as a civil society, we can really push uh, the government, especially politicians uh, who are not really interested in uh, the in international law or they are too busy uh, to think about this campaign. But instead, we, I mean, we as a civil society can push uh, these politicians uh, into this very, very normal uh, declaration of willingness to resolve conflict by international law. And now I think this campaign of law, not war, is is really now is the time to, you know, we should uh, together push through uh, this campaign. And I believe it is time to do so. Thank you very much. I want to say a, sh make a short comment for those in the audience who are not um, completely into public international law. Um, what Mr. Inuzuko was just referring to when he talked about ratification, the members of the UN Charter are automatically also parties to the statute of the International Court of Justice. But what he was talking about was the acceptance of 
the jurisdiction of the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. It's not the same thing, just to clarify this. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tadashi, for the opening welcome words. Uh, just before I introduce our first keynote speaker, just mention uh, that we are recording this session. It will be available afterwards. Uh, we'll make it available to all our participants who are online, but also participants here. We will follow up you know, with an email to everybody uh, with that. Uh, for those online, uh, you can use the chat session uh, to uh, put in any uh, comments or any resources or links that you think are appropriate to this. We also have a team online who will be adding links to some of the key uh, resources um, as the event continues. And there is a question and answer box also for those online to put in your questions to the panelists. There will be a short time for question and answer at the end of the presentations. It's now my great honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, Sir Kenneth Keith, uh, who's got up very early in New Zealand. Uh, it's half past six there, and Sir Ken Keith has already been waiting online for a while. Thanks so much, sir, for your patience while we sorted out the technical problems. Uh, Sir Kenneth Keith is a former judge from the International Court of Justice. He's also been a judge on the New Zealand Supreme Court, uh, and he is a Emeritus Professor of International Law at Victoria University Law School. Uh, his experience in this is well worth waiting for, and we look forward to your comments. So, Kenneth Keith, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alan. There's still a, a lot of uh, echoing. I think you have two connections open. Can you close one of them? Now try speaking. Can you try speaking now? Well, I can. I can. I can hear um, a lot of echoing. There we go. Okay. I think we're now okay. Try, try going now. Okay. Well. Yes. Thank uh, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alan, for involving me in this. Um, I, I think too often uh, lawyers, especially lawyers, think that the court is the only way of resolving disputes. But it isn't. Uh, if you go to Article 33 of the Charter of the UN, the, there is a long list of methods of settlement, negotiation, mediation, arbitration, conciliation, uh, regional methods, um, and judicial methods. So there needs um, sometimes to be a careful choice being made and New Zealand over the years has made a, quite a range of choices. Uh, sometimes disputes just disappear. I, I think of disputes that may be settled by not resolving the particular problems and issues. The Antarctic Treaty, for, for example, put to one side, put on ice, some people say, the issue of territorial claims. And that was done in the middle of the Cold War. Another instance of um, a matter just disappearing uh, from sight uh, is the nuclear ships row uh, involving the United States and other countries. So sometimes disputes just disappear. They are no longer uh, around. And at different times, New Zealand has used um, mediation, uh, for instance, in respect of the Rainbow Warrior case. And there's good offices as well, which were exercised in that particular case as well. Um, New Zealand in the early 1970s made a significant contribution to the proposal uh, the, the row that had arisen after the Southwest Africa cases, those disastrous cases in 1966. 
New Zealand on that occasion referred to the fact that the Secretary General in his most recent annual report had made the point that arbitration was not popular either, just as the court um, was not popular. Uh, and that particular document called attention to the, the great value that could be had by using the court to establish the law in a general way by reference to the Continental Shelf cases that had been decided in 1969. And soon after those, um, that ruling was given, the um, court, the, the three states involved, that's um, Denmark, Germany and the Netherlands, negotiated a treaty on the basis of the law that had been stated there. And, and in other cases, it will be a matter of management of resources, for instance. So there is a wide range of ways in which disputes can be resolved. Uh, so that's uh, an important matter to bear in mind. But I do um, think that the ICJ does need um, greater prominence, especially at the moment, given the the troubles it's having. I noticed, for instance, that Syria recently did not appear uh, in a request made by the Netherlands and um, uh, Canada uh, for provisional measures. Uh, and that takes me back to the times of the 1970s when Iceland did not appear uh, in the fisheries case. Um, Greece, Turkey did not appear in the Aegean Sea case, and France did not appear in the nuclear testing cases. They did appear in 1995, um, although not in their normal academic gear. On the other hand, Arthur Watts, the former legal advisor at the Foreign Office, did properly appear in his Queen's Council gear of the day so uh, on, on France's side so there is a, a challenge to the court at the moment uh, and it's a challenge that has arisen in other tribunals as well one one of the important aspects of the court I think is the much wider um, representation uh, of states which has appeared which have appeared in recent years they have, um, for instance, um, come from all parts of the, the world, from Eastern Europe. Um, we will hear later, I think, from uh, Council uh, Aurescu uh, in the Romania-Ukraine case. Uh, and so that was an Eastern European case. We had an Eastern European case between Georgia and um, Russia. Uh, there, there were cases from Africa, many cases from Africa, cases as well from the Americas. And so there's been a wide range of cases and a number of inter, intercontinental cases as well between Djibouti and France, for instance, Equatorial Guinea and France. And, and I suppose in a way you could say the Japan, Australia-Japan whaling case was another. So... New Zealand um, was involved in that case um, uh, as an intervener, and it's been an intervener very recently in the jurisdictional phase of the Ukraine-Russia um, genocide case. So <clears throat> the, the, there is an encouraging growth, I think, in the number of cases that have come from other parts of the world um, uh, whereas the old court, the Permanent Court of International Justice, was essentially a European court, the, there are cases now that come from many other parts of the world, and that's been a, a change over the life of the court. I, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that states seem to accept that the court's processes, their commitment to the rule of law, their commitment to the to getting the facts right, their commitment to getting the law right, <clears throat> all of those matters are um, prominent uh, in, for, in encouraging states to go to the ICJ. But one, one worry I have 
<clears throat> is in respect of the election process. There have been some elections recently, um, in my view, that have been unsatisfactory with candidates of insufficient calibre being elected. Another matter that I'm afraid does get neglected by uh, states in, or national groups in nominating and states in the electoral process uh, is the uh, need to have judges uh, who may have leadership qualities, who will be able to consider um, taking on the tasks of president and vice president, for instance. You need strong leaders within the court. Uh, for that purpose, but it's not always the case that that is achieved. So I'm happy later to take questions, but those are my immediate reflections um, on this very important matter of um, supporting law uh, and not going to war, especially uh, right at the moment with the dreadful situations in uh, uh, in, in the Ukraine, in the Middle East, um, in the Sahel, uh, and in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Ken. Uh, there are some questions that are coming into the Q&A box, but we'll hold those off until the other presentations. Um, I'll now pass it to my co-moderator, uh, Yuta, to introduce the next keynote yeah. speaker. It's a great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Juan Manuel Gomez Robles of Expo. Um, I will not repeat everything that you already read in the program. I will just add that he's currently the head of the Working Group on Amendments for the Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court. And I have had the pleasure to experience him in the special working group on the time of aggression. And also, I remember when you were under secretary for multi, multinational issues and, and human rights in Mexico, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was hosting a seminar on the upcoming, then upcoming Kampala Review Conference and trying to achieve consensual solutions for the possible adoption of the jurisdictional conditions and definitions for the crime of aggression. So I'm looking forward to what you're telling us. Thank you very much, Yuta. Thank you very much for your kind words. Um, if you allow me, I'd like very much to continue on where uh, Sir uh, Kenneth Kisa left. And it is about what I see as promising, uh, a promising trend uh, on the um, result to the jurisdiction of the ICJ. Indeed, there's been a steady increase in the number of states that have accepted the compulsory jurisdiction, and this is where the very good initiative led by Romania and others has contributed. And of course, one may think that 74 states having accepted the jurisdiction, the compulsory jurisdiction, is too little, but one needs to uh, remind that 36% uh, out of that number accepted it uh, after 2000. So it's quite a recent phenomenon, and we need uh, to continue promoting uh, the creation of the compulsory jurisdiction. But we need also to remind that states come to the, to the ACJ course on the basis of special agreements to which George Cannon uh, referred, which is a very important uh, also uh, aspect of the jurisdiction of the court. Even states that had accepted in the past the compulsory jurisdiction and then decided to withdraw. Um, let me think about the case of uh, uh, Equatorial Guinea and France, where France accepted to go back to the ICJ on the basis of an agreement. But there is also um, what, uh, and in that, in, in that sense, um, innovative, innovative uh, procedures 
like the one that led to Belize and Guatemala to submit their delimitation case as a result of a referendum, uh, actually two, two referenda, one in Belize, one in Guatemala. And it was not only the government of the people who decided to submit a long-standing dispute to the ACJ. And I think this is remarkable because it shows that more and more, uh, it's not only states, but people uh, trust the court and put their confidence in the court. And we see also an increase in the result of the court through jurisdictional clauses contained in multilateral treaties. And now, every time we negotiate a new multilateral treaty, almost automatically, when we come to the final clauses, that, uh, or those who deal, that deal with um, the dispute settlement, we have a proposal to insert a clause um, giving jurisdiction to the ICJ. We just did that for the recent treaty of biodiversity, the, the, the BDNJ treaty. And we are doing that already for the next multilateral treaty that will come into fruition, I think, in two years' time on cybercrime. And I understand that in Geneva, where they're working on a treaty on pandemics, and uh, in Nairobi, another one on plastics, all these, um, in all these very specialized uh, treaties, there will, we will find a uh, jurisdictional clause giving to the uh, giving the ACJ jurisdiction to entertain this is related to the implementation or the interpretation of that very convention or treaty. So I think that there is a very positive trend where we see also more and more countries um, resulting to the ACJ, it's not just those that have gone already a number of times. My region, Latin America and the Caribbean, has become one of the most frequent clients of the courts in very in a, in a huge variety of cases, not only about the limitation, it's also the protection of the environment, it's um, asylum, that was one of the first, or the application of the Vienna Convention on Cultural Relations, that was a case between Paraguay and the US, then uh, Mexico against the US. I mean, more and more the uh, 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 countries of, the, of my region go to the court. It is also true that they go thanks to the Pact of Bogota. The Pact of Bogota, which is the American Convention on um, the Settlement of Disputes, uh, has, it, has, is a driving force behind uh, cases uh, uh, coming from Latin America. Uh, what I can see also as a very positive trend in uh, how popular the advisory opinions have become. And uh, not only we will have uh, next year or the next two years, two uh, very important cases, one dealing with Palestine, the other one dealing with climate change. Um, but we're, uh, what we have been thinking as a new uh, feature that may uh, also expand the access to the court will be to allow the Secretary General to request advisory opinions to the court. Uh, what I mean is that the, Secretary, the, the General Assembly or the Security Council, but I think that a much better the General Assembly, would uh, give to the Secretary General the authorization on a permanent basis to request advisory opinions to the ACJ. Why we believe this is a good uh, initiative, which, by the way, was put on the table of the Charter Committee early in the 80s by Javier Perez de Cuella, through his legal counsel at the time, um, uh, uh, Mr. Flashauer. So the idea is that behind every single dispute, there are legal arguments. And if the Secretary General was one of the persons best informed in the world of everything that happens in the planet, 
were to be given that authority, he, he or she could very well perhaps um, prevent a larger conflict by requesting the ACJ to pronounce itself on a matter of law that would be put to it by the SG. Of course, I will not get into the politics. I know that it is not easy. Uh, there might be even reluctance to that, but we believe it's a way of giving more access to, uh, to the ACJ. And one final comment from my part would be that we generally agree that the rulings of the ACJ are implemented, implemented, complied uh, with by the parties generally. But some, in, in some cases, it's not a lack of political willingness that makes uh, one party uh, not to comply with the ruling. Uh, there are cases in which it's a lack of technical means or even financial means. And I think that the Secretary General, again, has put a very good example by helping uh, in a more or less recent case um, two African countries, uh, namely Cameroon and Nigeria, to comply uh, a ruling from the ACJ by providing them with those technical needs that they needed. And two years ago, when the president of the ACJ participated in the Security Council, when Mexico was a member, an elected member, of course, and under Mexico's presidency, the president of the ACJ said that this is a very good precedent. This is a way in which we, we could promote a better compliance with, uh, with uh, uh, rulings of the ACJ by engaging with the Secretary General. And the Secretary General, of course, would not take sides, but would just um, allow uh, or help the two parties to, to comply with the rules. So, to put it uh, simple, I am uh, quite optimistic about the result to the, to the ACJ, even if, of course, there are cases, and one that you, uh, Sir Kenneth, uh, just mentioned. Uh, uh, um, we, but given the state of affairs uh, in, in present uh, days, uh, the, the fact that we see so many cases um, uh, out of the docket of the ACJ is now 20 uh, pending cases plus two advisory proceedings pending as well. It is remarkable if we only compare this figure with, with what we had during the Cold War. Thank you very much. Ambassador Thomas Roblero, thank you very much. Really interesting comments on the use of the court and how it is done through different approaches, um, not only from those countries that have already accepted the compulsory jurisdiction, but also through mutual agreement and through the use of treaties, and how, it, particularly in Latin America, that is of interest to the use of the court. Uh, your very interesting idea of empowering the UN Secretary General. Uh, to give uh, to request advisory opinions. That's something I'm sure that our campaign, which we launched later today, Rebecca Shoot will do the launching of the campaign, War Not War. I think that's something we really want to pick up because it's a really interesting idea. And on the advisory opinions, just to note, if you're not already aware of this, that the International Court of Justice has extended the timeline for accepting written submissions on the climate change case until January the 20th of next year. So if your country is considering uh, to put in a submission, uh, there's still time. Uh, and the, the court has also opened up a little bit to international organizations. Uh, and there are some who have already been given uh, the, uh, the permission to write, put, in, uh, to put in the written submissions. Uh, so that's well worth, that case is well worth watching, of course, of interest to everybody. And of course, that advisory opinion was requested by a UN General Assembly resolution that had no opposition. So I think the judges are going to see this as a really important case, seeing virtually every country in the world is behind the, the court uh, uh, attending to the legal obligations of states with regards to climate change. So thank you so much. A lot of food for thought there. Um, and it's now my great pleasure to be able to invite 
um, our next, our, our final keynote speaker uh, to speak, and then we'll move to, to our next round of speakers. Um, and that's Professor Dr. Bogdan Orescu, who's the former foreign minister of Roman, Romania, a member of the UN International Law Commission, and has been an agent of Romania before the International Court of Justice, as was, and was instrumental in the move of Romania to accept the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, and through that experience, then has led the like-minded initiative, the Declaration, to um, increase the acceptance of ICJ jurisdiction. Uh, Professor Orescu, it's a pleasure to have you here, and we look forward to your comments. Well, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, and for, thank you so much for the uh, idea to put together this event, um, which is basically promoting the um, acceptance of uh, the jurisdiction in various ways of the jurisdiction of the uh, International Court of Justice. It's such a pleasure to see uh, Sir Kenneth Keith uh, uh, once again. Um, I've seen him on the bench. Uh, in our case, uh, of right time, the limitation in the back seat. And I'm very glad to see you uh, again. And um, I'm also um, glad that I have the privilege to address to you uh, um, not only as a former foreign minister of Romania, which had the, um, uh, the initiative to uh, promote the, um, the ICJ jurisdiction two years ago, but also as, um, um, as a member of the International Law Commission, and also as a candidate for uh, the International Court of Justice. So I cannot but agree with what uh, uh, Judge Keith mentioned about the um, caliber of, um, of the judges of the ICJ. Um, I think I think the, um, the promotion of the of the uh, jurisdiction of the court is extremely important, especially nowadays when um, we are traveling through um, such turbulent geopolitical times. Um, and um, I think new ways and modalities for um, uh, promoting, for making the acceptance of uh, the jurisdiction of the court um, more appealing are uh, extremely important, extremely useful. Um, and I think it's important, especially uh, taking into uh, into account the fact that. Um, International justice, international law for small to medium-sized states um, in, the, in, in, international, in the international community, um, they are very important. Um, Romania is such a small to medium-sized state, and for us, international law is in the very core of our, um, of our point of policy. Um, as the, 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 accept the uh, importance of, of, uh, of fully uh, respecting the, the full body of uh, international law is, is extremely relevant because for us, this is a way to ensure stability, predictability, and security in international relations. And uh, in this way, uh, we can uh, maximize the, um, uh, uh, the um, efficiency of our foreign policy demarches. And this is valid for more than 110 states, which are um, uh, members of the United Nations, which are small to medium-sized states. And think, uh, th that's why uh, the um, accessibility of uh, the ICJ is extremely um, important. And um, uh, especially then that, that we have uh, uh, such uh, resilience tests to, uh, uh, you know, to, um, um, to go through. Um, well, how this uh, uh, idea of, um, of launching a campaign for promoting the uh, jurisdiction uh, started two years ago. Um, as, as Judge Kiss just mentioned, um, uh, Romania uh, had an important case, the maritime delimitation case in the Black Sea uh, before the court. Uh, it was uh, finalized in 2009. I had the, um, the honor to be an uh, agent of, of Romania for this case. And um, uh, this case was um, uh, submitted to the court by means of a compromissory clause included in a um, uh, bilateral uh, treaty, a neighborhood treaty uh, with uh, Ukraine. And um, it is extremely important that the judgment in this case was passed with uh, unanimity and without any um, dissenting opinions or other declarations uh, by the judges, which is by now a unique case in the uh, this law of uh, the court. So a very solid, a very solid judgment, um, which for us also for Romania was important because um, uh, um, around 80% of the disputed area was allotted by the court to Romania in that case. That is around 10,000 square kilometers of continental shelf and exclusive economic zone. But what is was important was the way the court has arrived at these decisions. I'm not going to, to get into technical uh, uh, presentations of uh, the method of the limitation. But what was really important was the fact that at the end of the whole uh, proceedings, uh, the both parties to the to the uh, to the dispute accepted the, um, uh, the judgment of uh, of the court without any kind of comments, without any kind of preservations. That means that the, the judgment um, and the way the court has reached that judgment was sustainable. And this is extremely important in order for the judgments to be uh, implemented. And then um, in November uh, 2020, I had, the, uh, I had the privilege of uh, having a very important discussion with the then president 
um, and the current register of, um, of the port in the head during a visit which I paid as foreign minister at that time. And the idea of, um, of launching this, um, uh, this campaign for, um, uh, for accepting the um, uh, jurisdiction of the court by, by as many states as possible um, has uh, been um, uh, flagged out out of that discussion, which was, which was extremely, uh, extremely important. So um, uh, um, uh, on the 24th of June uh, 2021, uh, 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 we have launched uh, the first steps uh, in order for this campaign to be, um, um, to be um, uh, promoted. And then in November, we have adopted the declaration that was uh, just mentioned, um, and um, uh, the campaign was formally uh, launched. And I'm grateful to the core group of uh, supporting states, which was composed by uh, Japan, by Liechtenstein, Mexico, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, uh, Spain, and, and Switzerland. And Together we have worked on, on the uh, substance of, um, of this um, campaign. We have uh, um, negotiated the text of, um, of the declaration. Romania is um, depository of uh, this uh, declaration, and uh, currently 33 states have uh, endorsed the uh, declaration, the most the recent one being uh, Malta uh, on the 9th of March uh, this year. And I hope that um, uh, the debate today will also give an impetus to the um, um, uh, acceptance of um, the jurisdiction of the court, and perhaps we can find new avenues on how to promote the um, acceptance uh, of the jurisdiction uh, of uh, the court. The declaration, uh, which I invite everybody to read, um, refers to the ICJ's important role in promoting the rule of law globally, and inventory is the main reasons. What are the main reasons um, um, for accepting the court's jurisdiction? First, the competence over any legal dispute among states. Then, um, the vast expertise in dispute settlement, its efficiency and affordability as a dispute settlement mechanism. Of course, this can be improved even more. Uh, we have already discussed about um, some uh, uh, possibilities. Its anchoring in state consent as the basis of um, contentious jurisdiction, its contribution to the realization of the principles and purposes of the United Nations such as the maintenance of international peace and security, and not least the declaration encourages states to have recourse to the ICJ and confer jurisdiction uh, by any means envisaged in the statute. And of course, the declaration elaborates on the possibilities, which are the, the avenues for accepting the jurisdiction. Of course, the unilateral declarations are very uh, important, as the one which was uh, also um, adopted by Romania in 2015, during my first mandate as foreign minister, I have uh, promoted and I was successful in convincing uh, the Romanian parliament for passing a, a piece of legislation uh, by which Romania has accepted the, uh, the compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ. At that time, we were the 72nd state to accept uh, the um, compulsory jurisdiction. And now there are 74 states. So there, were, there were states which withdrew, as, as my colleague um, from the ILC said, well, um, we don't like any more the jurisdiction, but perhaps we can use other means. Uh, but there are also others who have joined the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the list of, of states accepting the jurisdiction by unilateral declarations. But we have also, um, uh, and we are also promoting by the declaration, the introduction of compromissory clauses in treaties, bilateral or multilateral uh, treaties, um, and also uh, the conclusion of special agreements. Very important for states coming from Eastern Europe, uh, and I think it is really important that uh, also in the composition of, um, of, the, uh, of the court, um, uh, there should be judges coming from that part of Europe because there are cases which are coming. And perhaps uh, uh, our case um, uh, that I mentioned is an example in that respect, the withdrawal of, the, of uh, reservations to treaties. Many states from, uh, from Eastern Europe during the communist times have introduced reservations to multilateral treaties, blocking the possibility to um, uh, go to the ICJ for solving their disputes. And after uh, 1990, uh, these states started to withdraw uh, these reservations. And we have done the same in Romania, and we are encouraging everybody to do the same. And last but not least, the declaration also mentions uh, forum prorogatum, which is another possibility for um, accepting the jurisdiction of the court. Forum prorogatum was used uh, in the past, including in well, quite recent uh, times. Uh, but uh, it needs to be, uh, to be further uh, used. And indeed, there are more and more uh, cases on the docket of the court, more and more complex cases, and some of them um, are uh, and will be perhaps more technical. That means that the court needs to use uh, experts um, in various areas. 
the opinion on, on climate change is one important example in that respect. And um, I'm glad that um, also as a foreign minister, I took the decision for Romania to join the core group uh, of the 17 states led by Vanuatu, which uh, promoted the, um, the resolution uh, to uh, request the, the opinion uh, from the courts. Uh, very glad that this resolution was adopted unanimously. And um, uh, as a member of the ILC and also uh, co-chair of the study group on sea level rise, which um, is now under debate in the, uh, in the sixth committee and what we have done this year on sea level rise, I, um, I hope that, um, uh, and I'm confident that um, uh, the work of the commission in that respect will be of, uh, uh, of uh, some relevance uh, also for the ICJ when this opinion will be, um, will be um, well drafted. And um, uh, of course, uh, I hope that, uh, well, I'm speaking uh, only as a candidate now, uh, if elected, I can bring my expertise also to that uh, opinion. Um, as, last but not least, I think it's very important that uh, everybody encourages, uh, by all means, um, the acceptance of the jurisdiction of the court. And um, uh, this means that the court will be, uh, uh, well, we have a lot of work to do. We'll have to deal with even more cases. And um, this is a good thing because as Professor Bejawi, uh, former president of the court once said, um, well, more dispute solved means less jungle in international relations, more order in international relations. That means more rules-based international order. And that means more security for all of us. At the end of the day, um, individuals, even if are not uh, parties to this dispute before the court, well, they are at the end uh, of uh, the whole bunch of demarches that we are undertaking in order for this world to be peaceful and secure. So thank you so much. Professor Arnsky, thank you very much for those comments, uh, for being here with us today and also for your leadership um, on the campaign with the declaration uh, for acceptance of the ICJ jurisdiction. Just a couple of comments, reflections before I introduce the next speaker. Um, I've noticed in the declaration of the 33 countries, I think it's two that have yet to actually deposit any instrument accepting the compulsory jurisdiction. So I think there's an aspirational nature to joining that declaration, as well as one that's reflective of those countries that have already accepted the jurisdiction of the court. And I think that's a very positive way that that declaration has been put forward. Um, and secondly, you mentioned in the, the case that you were agent for, that um, with the decision from the court, both parties accepted the decision. And the reflection from the president of the International Court of Justice, Joan Donoghue, at the Security Council session on January the 12th this year on the rule of nations, uh, where she was speaking about the practice um, and the experience of the International Court of Justice. And she reflected that in most of the cases, nearly all of the cases, both parties and contentious cases did accept the decisions. That is somewhat surprising um, that here you have both parties, even the one that may have lost out in the decision, accept the decision as a testament to the way that the court undertakes its, its process of deliberations of going into incredible depth on the background and the legal rights and the legal responsibilities that are around, and so provides the capacity for acceptance of both parties uh, in the disputes. And I think Judge Wiedermantri made the same comment, and Nishan may reflect on that when it comes to his comments, that in most cases, the decisions from the court are accepted and implemented. That's a very positive experience coming out of the International Court of Justice. So with those reflections, I'm now going to introduce Rebecca Schutt, who's the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions in the United States, and also the co-chair of the Washington Working Group on the International Criminal Court. Um, and is um, also one of the key core group of the leaders of the campaign we're launching today, which is Legal Alternatives to War, Law Not War. So, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alan, and good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen here in the room in New York and everyone joining us online. Um, it is a pleasure to join you today as Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions, one of the co-sponsors of the Legal Alternatives to War, Law Not War campaign. CGS is a non-governmental, non-profit, non-partisan, membership-based organization with consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the UN. We are a member-driven movement with the common goal of a democratic world federation predicated on peace, human rights, and the rule of law, which was founded by some of the greatest minds and peace champions of the last century, Einstein, William Fulbright, Norman Cousins, Ben Berend, 
whose motto, Law Not War, animates the campaign we are proud to co-sponsor to today. My organization and its counterpart at the global level, which is the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, remain guided by a declaration of purpose that was promulgated in 1947 at our uh, founding. And it begins with the assertion that we believe that peace is not merely the absence of war, but the presence of justice, of law, and of order. And here we believe that the UN Charter provides not only a moral compass towards this vision, but offers an alternative to conflict, and an underutilized alternative, in fact, in the institution of the International Court of Justice as a means for the specific resolution of disputes among states without recourse to the threat or reality of violence. And so as we embark on Disarmament Week and also on International Law Week, from the experience of participating actively in civil society consultations also around the new agenda for peace, with humility, I must observe that all too often conversations about justice and the institutions that render it are absent from discussions of pathways to peace. Lasting peace necessarily entails the expectation of accountability and intolerance for impunity. And this includes legal accountability. Um, as a lawyer, I find this omission glaring, but moreover, as co-convener of the Washington Working Group for the International Criminal Court, I'm intimately familiar with the important role that civil society can play in rectifying this oversight and supporting the essential judicial institution of the ICJ. And here we commend the leadership of like-minded states, including Mexico, Romania, as well as Japan, Liechtenstein, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, Spain, and Switzerland, as well as the 33 endorsing countries of the Declaration on Promoting ICJ Compulsory Jurisdiction over Contentious Disputes. We urge other states to do so. Um, and further, as a civil society organization, we stand ready to support you in this endeavor, just as we supported the establishment and continued evolution of the ICC. Thus, we are proud to partner on the strategic campaign, which combines education about the value and impact of ICJ jurisdiction for a variety of constituencies with advocacy to enhance ICJ jurisdiction. And here, the campaign has six primary AMA themes. Number one, to increase the number of states accepting the compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ over contentious disputes. Number two, to encourage more frequent use of the court as a dispute resolution mechanism provided in international treaties through um, compromissory clauses. Number three, to support UN bodies to more frequently and effectively request ICJ advisory opinions on critical issues. Number four, to encourage states to adopt constitutional amendments or legislative measures to affirm the UN Charter prohibition of war and the obligation to resolve international disputes peacefully, including through the ICJ. Five, we encourage states to nominate high caliber judges with backgrounds that are reflective of the diversity of legal systems and humanity as a whole, <clears throat> as consistent with Article 9 of the ICJ statute's direction that the main forms of civilization and principal legal systems of the world be assured within the court. And lastly, we urge states to provide the ICJ with adequate funding and resources to fulfill its mandate. And here, um, I um, echo and uh, underscore His Excellency's comments on resources, including technical support and also creative thinking about realistic financing needs for implementation of decisions. If all this seems ambitious, um, I take the opportunity to recollect that in 1995, a group of 25 human rights organizations began campaigning for a permanent international criminal court to hold individuals to account for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And it worked. Um, and we do not need to will the ICJ into being as we did with the ICC. It is a foundational element of the global legal order. However, it does need our support to realize its full potential as envisioned by the UN Charter. And here I, I humbly call on all present in the room and the many online to join us in supporting this essential institution's ability to render fair, effective, and independent decisions that make justice visible and present an alternative to war. So thank you, thank you all. And I look forward to the discussion today and moving forward with the campaign in the future. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And just before I hand back to Yuta, just a couple of follow-up points from what Rebecca mentioned, the legal alternatives to war, war not war campaign, which has been launched today, is hosted by Unfold Zero. So those online, you have the, um, the link to that in 
the chat uh, the chat box. For those here, it's unfoldzero.org, and you just look under Be Involved, War Not War, and you'll find the information for the campaign there. Uh, it's co-launched by six organisations, Aotearoa Lawyers for Peace, that's speaking from New Zealand, uh, Basel Peace Office, Citizens for Global Solutions, Unfold Zero, the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, and the World Future Council. And then we already have 50 participating organisations and another 50 organisations that are required about will probably also join as participating organisations. So it's, as it's just a launch, that's the start. We envisage it's going to grow and we invite everybody to participate. I now pass over to Yuta, who will introduce the next two speakers. Yuta. Before I introduce the next two speakers, I just want to clarify again that the word compulsory should not be misunderstood. In acceptance of the compulsory jurisdiction, it does not mean that states cannot also use conciliation or mediation or any other form of the Pacific settlements of disputes. It may mean that they, there will be new developments after the conciliation. There may be outstanding questions where the other Pacific settlements may not work. And as long as one of the parties then goes to the court, the other one has to accept, has to go there too. So just not just to prevent a misunderstanding about this. Now, with regard to my next task, which I was very much looking forward to, Professor Roger Clark, no bio that you can have Googled or read before would ever do justice to what this man has done on behalf of human rights and peace. Um, maybe the fastest way for you to get a more of an inkling would be to look at a book of essays that was produced in honor of him on international law and crime and justice. It was called For the Sake of Present and Future Generations. If you just go through the titles of the essays, you will get already an inkling. There's, for example, an, an essay by Sir Kenneth Keith, which is called on in individual criminals' responsibility, of dog's law, offending against sound popular feeling, semicolons and commas, which is clearly a reference to the approach uh, of Roger Clark to looking at the commas and to looking at the sound, sound feelings about, about any kind of matter. And I remember your essay from Dr. Strangelove to strange love to Dr. Sue's contributions of Professor Roger Clark in the legal norm against nuclear weapons. This, this comes from a participation of a conference by New York Law School exploring civil society through the writings of Dr. Seuss. And uh, Roger Clark had the audacity to pick up the butter, the butter battle book of Dr. Seuss where you have implicitly, only implicitly, um, talk about nuclear weapons, but he turned it into the very serious subject of what has international law to say about weapons of mass destruction. Roger, it's your floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Eliza. I have to say that the absolute best bit of propaganda I ever did with my children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren is Dr. Seuss's Butter Battle book. If you haven't read it to the kids, buy it and do it. Thank, thank you. Look, I'm honored to participate in this significant event, not least because of the group of colleagues involved. I note in particular Sir Ken, who, who taught the first and I think the only course in international law that I ever took exactly 60 years ago uh, this month. So thanks again, Ken. <laughs> Peter, Alan and I uh, have worked on nuclear and ICC issues since the 1990s. And hiding modestly in the back of the room is my co-author on penal matters involving the International Criminal Court, Betty Holler. Betty is a terrific Slovenian candidate for judge on the ICC in December's elections. When Alan Weir asked me to contribute to this uh, event, I was at a conference in Vienna in which Uta was also participating, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. 
the ICC and the ICJ are both vital complementary pieces of the architecture for enforcing international criminal law. Both suffer from the same inadequacy, namely, namely the failure of states to accept their jurisdiction fully. This is particularly acute for the ICC in the case of the crime of aggression, where what became essentially an opt-in situation has created a regrettable system similar to that of the optional clause in Article 36.2 of the Statute of the ICJ. I noticed that some unseen hand has cleverly deposited in front of most of you a very significant document from the Global Institute on the Prevention of Aggression, which is aimed at fixing just that situation. I commend it to you. I share the enthusiasm, obviously, of previous speakers in overcoming the mindsets, the failures of imagination that have led us to the present limitations on ICJ jurisdiction. It is thus that I want to talk a little bit about some of the reasons or the excuses that have got us in that situation. It's worth noting that of the 70 odd states have accepted the optional clause, the UK alone among the P5 has currently done so. It's hard to laud the United Kingdom for its acceptance. During the oral hearings on preliminary issues in the Marshall Islands case on the obligation to negotiate the abolition of nuclear weapons, the UK hinted that if it were to lose, it might need to reconsider its position on accepting jurisdiction, take its ball and go home. In fact, it modified acceptance twice as a result of this case, once during the course of the proceedings and again at the end. The result is a declaration of acceptance, which is, like many others, so full of exceptions as to be almost illusory. There are several cases currently before the court has been pointed out that rely on compromissory clauses in multilateral treaties. But there are also pitfalls here. When ratifying the Genocide Convention, many states, including India and the USSR, put in a reservation to Article 9 of the treaty, which confers jurisdiction of the court over disputes involving the convention. In one of its early advisory opinions, the court effectively accepted that such a reservation could be made. When the US was finally getting to ratification in the late 1980s, it decided to include what it called the Indian Reservation. Perhaps calling it the USSR Reservation was a little embarrassing, even to the United States. I had occasion around then to visit the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow and was stunned to be told that the USSR intended to upstage the United States by removing its reservation of Article 9. It did so early in 1989 and the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic followed suit shortly afterwards. Lo and behold, this is the jurisdictional provision on which Ukraine is relying on its current case against Russia under the Genocide Convention. Reservations to multilateral treaties should be discouraged and old ones should be removed. Last year, Dr. Bertram Ramsharan, formerly acting UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, published a very creative book entitled Modernizing the Role of the International Court of Justice, which I commend to you. He argues that the phrase, quote, all matters specially provided in the Charter of the United Nations in Article 36.1 of the Statute of the Court is of potential significance in expanding the jurisdiction of the court. I had always thought of it as a dead letter but Ram Charan makes some good arguments. In a forward to the book, I commented, based on my own two experiences appearing before the court in cases involving nuclear weapons, 
if I may quote myself. I got the distinct feeling in both instances that many of the judges saw these basic issues on nuclear weapons as toxic to their professional health and best avoided. There were exceptional judges up to the task, part of what needs to be achieved for Ram Sharan's brilliant idea, and may I add the current project, is to find a way to select candidates to the court who are up to the job. I leave you with that thought. Thank you. Yeah, I wished always that Roger could go on talking when, whenever he ends his speeches. Um, this is now my introduction to Nesham Unantekera, who is, how should I say, one of the prime members of the NGO community. He was assistant to Judge Vera Mantri, and you should read all the different uh, opinions to the nuclear weapons. Uh, case advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. You have really followed in his footsteps, I would say. You research human rights, environment, peace, and you advocate for it also very much by now participating and being deeply involved in the preparations for the summit for the future coming up at the United Nations next year. So I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Judah. Just to check whether you can hear me. Yes, very well. Thank you very much. And again to Alan and everyone involved for this invitation. It's a great honor uh, for both uh, following the great list of speakers who spoke before me. And also, as Judah, you said, uh, to share a few thoughts on His Excellency Judge Christopher Viramantri, the former Vice President of the International Court of Justice, with whom have had a wonderful privilege period very early in my professional career as a lawyer and as a researcher and uh, i have of course the you know privilege of going last after many distinguished speakers so it's kind of to echo that i agree with what was already said and will not repeat some of it but to stress on one area that judge veeramantri really embarked upon uh, throughout his career uh, and uh, really excelled uh, when he was a judge of the International Court of Justice uh, between the years 1990 and 2002, the last three years being the vice president, was to utilize international law as an instrument of peace. And this was, in fact, one of the key pillars of the institution that he founded subsequent to his uh, leaving the International Court of Justice in 2002 in Sri Lanka, of which I became director uh, for six years. And he really pushed forth uh, the usage and utilization of international law as an instrument of peace in all sense of the word, by expanding the jurisprudence of the court, by bringing in wider vistas from indigenous systems and cultures and religious philosophy uh, into the jurisprudence of the court, and the nuclear weapons case and his dissenting opinion was referred to. Uh, but one of the key messages that he left with me and the generation to follow was really the impact that the International Court of Justice has had as a truly global institution with great prospect to expand. Professor Clark and others were referring to this, how this can be expanded further. And then, Alan, you mentioned uh, some of the stories that came with uh, this uh, impact of the International Court of Justice, and several examples were already mentioned by the excellencies before me. One uh, key uh, example that he would always share was the case between Libya and Chad with regard to uh, the issue of the Aosu Strip. Now, uh, Libya to the north and uh, Chad to the south had a dispute over this uh, area. Uh, but before getting into a situation of a serious armed conflict, both parties or both countries in this case decided to come before the International Court of Justice to solve this dispute. And the International Court of Justice in 1994, as in the case in all the cases, went into detail uh, into the histories and how this uh, you know, land resource was uh, you know, shared between the countries and held in favor of Chad. Now, if there was a situation that Libya was to uh, 
disrespect this decision, that would have been the coverage of uh, you know media across the world. But if the alternative happened, Libya and Chad agreed and respected the decision. And then they decided on how this area in line with the judgment should be handed over to Chad. And that was one of the many, many ways in which the International Court of Justice had gone into a situation that could have resulted in massive bloodshed, but avoided that. And that's one point I wanted to stress here. The, the fact that the International Court of Justice statute is read within the UN um, Charter and the aspects of preventive diplomacy or peace building or making it a peace institution uh, is a key uh, element that we need to look into it. And soon upon retiring from the International Court of Justice, uh, Judge Viramantri wrote uh, one of his many, many books. This one uh, in 2004 uh, called Universalizing International uh, Law, which was one of the key themes he worked uh, on. Uh, he asks three questions in this book. He asks, in the 19th century, is there something called international law? And in the 20th century, does international law matter? Now, we unfortunately had to go through two very serious world wars to arrive at the UN Charter and the Statute of the International Court of Justice. And as uh, Sir Kenneth uh, uh, Keith, as well as Professor Clark just mentioned, uh, that, you know, much sacrifice had gone into creating this institution and there's much that can be done from the Pacific Settlements of Dispute clauses that was referred to Article 33 and so forth. Now, the final question Judge Viravantri asks us is about the 21st century. He leaves this, this caveat that the 20th century was a century of lost opportunity for humankind and that the 21st century is a century of last opportunity for humankind given that the dangers of the weaponization of the planet and the mass waste of destruction that we've created for ourselves. And he answers this in this way. He says the 21st century should be the century in which international law prevail against the might of force and other ways and means of which we have settled our disputes during the last 20 centuries and before. And with that hope that we become good ancestors and those who are going to come after us will look back and say we tried to move the conversation from brutal force to having law supreme international law supreme and the way to dis uh, resolve our uh, disputes in a peaceful manner that we were good ancestors and i believe this is our role as good trustees on our planet home earth thank you Before we go to questions, before we go to questions, um, I want to point out that accepting the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice does not only uphold, help to uphold a peremptory norm, namely the prohibition of the use of force in violation of the United Nations Charter. It's also a human rights issue. It helps to uphold human dignity and human freedom because it prevents states, I hope, from turning human beings into cannon fodder and collateral damage and killing tools. And that happens in war, even if you do not commit any war crimes. So I want to thank all the speakers who have been given fantastic presentations. We have just over 12 minutes, I think, left before we're supposed to close up. We might be able to go 15 minutes. So what I'm suggesting we do, we have a number of questions that have already been lodged in the quick Q&A box. I know there's going to be some questions or interventions from people on the floor. I'm going to first address one of the online questions because it's very brief. Then I'm going to go to some questions from the four interventions from the floor. I'll add two more questions from the Q&A box and then we'll come back to all the panellists. We really only have one time for one round so that we can get as many questions and interventions as possible and get as many responses as possible from the panelists. So the first one, which is from online, which is actually quite short and easy to do, is the question is, is there reference to the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice included in the People's Pact for the Future, which has been pulled together by civil society under the Coalition for the UN We Need as recommendations for the UN Summit for the Future in 2024? And the answer to that is yes. 
It's in the interim people's pact for the future. And if you want to see that, you should see that on the Coalition for the UN We Need website. And thanks to Dan Burrell here, who's one of the key coordinators. And I think Jeffrey Huffines is here also, another of the coordinators, for that civil society process feeding into the summit of the future. Uh, now I'll go to the, anyone from round the floor if I've got any comments and questions. And firstly, and can you introduce yourself just briefly and any other intervention or questions? Bruce. I'm Bruce Nuts, and I'm the president of Citizens for Global Solutions. Uh, my question is the uh, issue of um, states using conquest as a way to get territory. And we're seeing this in at least a couple of instances where countries are using uh, military conquest to claim territory, which we know is against international law. What is international law doing to prevent this from happening? Because it continues to happen. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, other questions or short interventions from around the table from the room? Yes, Shazia. Um, Shazia Rafi, former Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action, currently uh, President of Air Quality Asia. I look forward to the climate change case that is coming, but my question is related to the case on Palestine. Um, uh, I understand the state of Palestine did take the steps to go through the pretrial chamber and become part in some fashion of the International Criminal Court. I myself am not a lawyer. Um, our legal expert, David Donhat Katenu, uh, who is my successor, is here as well. But I left just as that was happening at PGA. And I just wonder, given that we've got a live situation of crimes from both sides being committed in a live uh, war right now in Israel-Palestine, how much of the legal framework that these states did join is going to be able to catch the criminal acts after they've been committed in a legal process later? Okay, thank you very much. Now, just a reminder before I go to the next question or intervention that while we're focusing primarily on the International Court of Justice. A number of speakers have mentioned the importance of the range of mechanisms that are available. And in some of these, there will be an interplay between what can happen at the International Criminal Court and what can happen at the International Court of Justice. So when we come to the panelists, I encourage you to look at the broader and not only on the ICJ, even though the ICJ is the main one we're focusing on. I think this is a question, for example, on here, that we want to go a bit broader than the ICJ. Okay, do we have any other comments or questions from around the table before I go to two more from online? I don't see any. So two more that have come in online. One is, can anyone speak about the current case in the ICJ with regards to Rohingya? So that's another of the genocide cases that's there with quite a novel approach to the jurisdiction. Um, that has been employed in order to get that case uh, into the court. Uh, and the other one, which had some reference to what Shazi was talking about, but was a bit broader, and that was from Paul Paul from online, what type of interventions or processes could take place in the International Court of Justice, primarily, uh, but maybe also the other ones, we know something's also happening in the ICC, with regards to both the Russia-Ukraine conflict and the israel Hamas. Complex. So those are the questions that we have. I'll go first to Sir Ken Key. If you've got some replies, responses, Ken, to any of those five, five questions, four questions. Ken? Uh, no, you're mute. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, Ken, you're still muted. Yeah, maybe you're still muted. Now speak. Right, thank you. Um, That's better. On, on, on the uh, connection between the ICJ and criminal tribunals, my experience just goes back to the uh, role of the ICTY um, in, uh, and, and the Srebrenica case in particular, where the um, ICJ um, made use of the factual findings in the um, ICTY, and that was um, very valuable. Um, 
we, we disagreed with the ruling on law in that case uh, in, in the ICTY, but we did um, find the facts as found by the ICTY very helpful. There was also a report, in fact, prepared by David Harlan for the Secretary General, and New, another New Zealander. Um, we found that report on the fall of Srebrenica extremely valuable as well. Um, so that's enough, I think, on that point. Just on the um, uh, question of um, uh, acquisition of territory by conquest, the Friendly Relations Declaration does attempt to um, deal with that issue. And, and I mean, it goes all the way back, doesn't it, to the Stimson document, uh, doctrine that um, you can't acquire territory by conquest. Um, so that's enough for, for me, I think, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Ken Kay. Thank you. And uh, unfortunately, Ambassador Gomez Bogleto had to leave for another appointment, but Professor Orsk, you are still here. So can you um, answer those, yes, those questions that you had? I'll try to refer also to the, um, to the question on the military conquest. I think, uh, I think not only that the use of force is, uh, is legal in uh, international law, but there is also an obligation of states not to recognize legal occupation. Um, and that was reaffirmed by, by several times by, uh, by various international bodies, courts and tribunals, including Security Council, European Court of Human Rights. It's quite clear that, that such, a, such a situation of, uh, of military conquest in order to occupy territory and conquest, of course, means um, use of force um, is uh, uh, absolutely against international law and international law forbids that. And now how, how uh, uh, force can, can, uh, can react? I think it's, uh, it's important that if courts are competent to uh, act, well, they can be used for, um, for, for, for provisional measures um, uh, forbidding um, the continuation of such, uh, of such activities. And we have, of course, before us uh, the allegations of genocide case uh, in, uh, before the court. That will stop here. Thank you very much. I now go to Rebecca for any comments on those questions. Um, sure. I think I would like to take the, the question on the, the Rohingya situation um, and full disclosure that um, I was working in chambers at the pretrial chamber in the International Criminal Court on the companion case that contemplated jurisdiction um, in a different kind of jurisdiction over uh, the crimes allegedly being committed against the Rohingya population. Um, so I think this is indeed a very novel use of the International Court of Justice and an exemplar of concurrent and complementary pathways to justice. Um, so in November of 2019, the Gambia, with the support of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, filed a case, the Gambia versus the Myanmar, um, under, with the ICJ, um, under the auspices of the Convention of the Prevention um, and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Um, so both Gambia, uh, which ratified the convention in 1978, um, and Myanmar are currently uh, litigating this matter before the court. The court is seized of the issue as we speak and has had to contemplate some very um, compelling questions with it matters of jurisdiction. So Myanmar argued that there was no dispute, first and foremost, between Gambia and Myanmar on the interpretation and application of the Genocide Convention. Um, here, the court ruled that a, um, a dispute need not be explicit, that it could be implied, and so forth found in favor of the Gambia that the case could continue. Uh, Myanmar also argued that Gambia was unaffected by the alleged breaches of the Genocide Convention and therefore lacked standing. And here again, the court threw out that claim and found that all state parties to the Genocide Convention share, I'm going to quote this, a common interest in ensuring the prevention and punishment of acts of genocide. As such, any state, not just those affected by the violations, can bring a claim against any other to ensure compliance with the convention. So this is an enormously powerful instance of the use of the court uh, to address atrocities. And it complements, um, as opposed to contradicts or conflicts with, other ongoing mechanisms. So we mentioned, I mentioned at the outset, the uh, case before the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over personal criminal responsibility. 
and has found in the first instance through the pretrial chamber that there is adequate reason to believe based on submissions made by third parties um, and made um, by uh, the parties of Bang Bang Bangladesh. Uh, that there is adequate reason to believe that the crime of deportation was committed as a crime against humanity was committed against the Rohingya people. The ICC case only contemplates this specific crime of deportation. And the reason being is that it was um, a force to contemplate the question of territorial jurisdiction, given that Myanmar is not the state party to the Rome Statute, and jurisdiction therefore arises from Bangladesh being a state party. And uh, deportation in the uh, reasoning of the pretrial chamber, which I supported, is a continuous crime. And so therefore the fact that deportation was occurring on the soil of the recipient country, Bangladesh afforded jurisdiction. And there is also a third um, mechanism, the independent um, investigative mechanism for Myanmar, which is a UN body um, which has jurisdiction that is broader than both of these actually, um, because the case before the ICJ only looks at genocide to the Rohingya the um, ICC case only looks at um, uh, personal jurisdiction over the crime of deportation, but the IIMM um, is um, seized with the question of all crimes um, potentially committed, uh, genocide war crimes, crimes against humanity on the soil of Myanmar uh, since 2011. And so not just against the Rohingya people, but other alleged abuses of the military. And there's one final point that I will make here, which is that currently representing Myanmar before the ICJ are representatives of the junta. And so there has been a clarification that the ICJ hearing arguments, taking memorials from these representatives um, does not mean that the UN recognizes the junta as the legitimate government of Myanmar. Um, so all that to say that we hope that these uh, concurrent pathways will find justice for the victims and survivors. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And if we had a whole day, we could go into similar <laughs> depth on many other cases to see the richness of possibilities that there are involved in the ICJ and in the other complementary measures, which this is, you know, campaign is looking to. Uh, we have just a few minutes. Well, we're actually over, but we'll stretch a few more minutes for comments also from Roger and then Nisha. Roger? Or Alan. Uh, I want to say just a word or two about containing territory by force. Uh, and unfortunately, as I alluded to in, in my talk, uh, the major powers managed to sandbag the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court in that context. But there is an important project out there uh, pursued by Liechtenstein and others which would enable uh, the setting up of an ad hoc tribunal under the auspices of the General Assembly with the consent of, of Ukraine to address those kind of issues. And, and I commend that material right now too. It, it requires much more exposition than I can give here. Uh, uh, secondly, um, the PGA question uh, about uh, Palestine uh, and the International Criminal Court. Palestine has indeed acceded uh, to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, as I see it, potentially there's jurisdiction over both what uh, Hamas has done and what the Israelis have done and are about to do uh, in that context. Again, what would be half an hour to uh, do a decent exposition of, of all of that. It's complicated by the fact that uh, uh, the Palestine Authority, which uh, did the accession to the statute, doesn't have much control over what Hamas uh, uh, does, if, if any, um, I don't think that's ultimately a problem to the uh, jurisdictional issues. But I don't think there's any question that these are really uh, significant matters that will be uh, agitated uh, through the prosecutor's office uh, and probably have already started to be uh, uh, looked at uh, in that uh, context. Re really useful questions. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And Nisha, did you want to address any of those questions? Uh, thanks, Alan. Just to add, I think the, um, the responses covers the questions, but I think uh, in the whole attempt today of law not war, uh, and we look at the complementarity between the different institutions which you mentioned, including the judgments that have come across this, I mean, given that the Permanent Court of International Justice, we've had almost now 100 years of uh, jurisprudence, which adds to the work of the ICJ, should be taken in light with the other tribunals and ad hoc tribunals that were mentioned. Uh, and in all honesty, this campaign, I hope it doesn't take us 22 years to get there. 
because uh, I think uh, time is of absolute essence and there should not be any place for war in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nishan. Just a quick follow-up from what Roger said on the Liechtenstein initiatives in the UN General Assembly. For the UN General Assembly to deal with acts of aggression when the Security Council is prevented from doing that also opens up possibilities, for example, the UNGA to take an advisory opinion, a request an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on some of these issues, whether it's on the Russia-Ukraine or on others. Um, and, and as we've seen, you know, with the advisory opinion, there is much greater attention to the advisory opinions. The number of states participating in the climate case, for example, is, is phenomenal. Um, and there's much greater attention to the role of the court can play in these advisory opinions. And then the follow-up to those, which is implementation through the body asking the question. So there's a lot of food for thought here. We see a lot of it's dark times, but there's also some wonderful initiatives that address these dark times and gives us ways of dealing with these better, of preventing some of these you know, conflicts escalating into armed conflicts and how to respond when they, when they do. Uh, and thank you so much to everybody who's come along. We look forward to keeping in touch with you as we continue exploring um, ideas and, and taking forward and supporting the like-minded group that Romania has sort of brought together uh, with the declaration. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for coming. Sorry for taking a, a bit too much of your time and have a wonderful afternoon.